I'd like to divide healthcare in Barbados roughly into eight periods. The early years of settlement from 1627 to the 1640s when sugar took over. Plantation medicine in the first 140 years of slavery from the 1640s to 1780. What is known as the amelioration period from the 1780s to emancipation post-emancipation, those few years of a little bit of confusion, the epidemic era of the 50s, the 1850s, the early public health measures, including piped water, the most significant achievement of all in the 1860s to the 1930s, the post-1937 to independence period, and the modern era of post-1966. It would take the entire lecture series to cover it all, and each lecture would need to be several hours long. So I won't do that to you. This lecture will therefore focus largely on the second and third periods, plantation medicine from the 1640s to emancipation, with an account of the slave society and the medical care or attempts at it of that era, Emphasis on the work of the remarkable physician, Dr. William Hillary, 270 years ago, and his influences, the amelioration period, an overview of what I call the dark century from 1838 to 1937, and the linkages between those early periods and today's cutting edge research at the Chronic Disease Research Center of the UWI. Now from 1627 until the early successes of the sugar industry, Barbados was a frontier society with primitive social organization and no such thing as organized health care. The first adventurous physicians here would have had little at their disposal but a smattering of their familiar medicines and possibly some experimentation with the unfamiliar tropical vegetation. A typical medicine chest of an early doctor would have had a variety of plant products such as cloves, rhubarb, and nutmeg, oil of cinnamon, and oil of turpentine, chemicals such as mercury and ammonia, and perhaps just two, just two active substances, opium for pain and ipecacuana to induce vomiting. The story of the Cochrane brothers is recorded in the Scottish Records Office in Edinburgh and told by Richard Sheridan in his splendid book, Doctors and Slaves. Dr. Cochrane said that he had accidentally met a young surgeon going to Guinea in West Africa who had been in Jamaica and Cochrane made a bargain with him, paying him the enormous sum of four pounds for his instruments, his chest, medicines, and bedclothes, which he said, is the cheapest way I could furnish myself. And off he went on a voyage first to Guinea and then to Jamaica with a slave ship. With the establishment of the sugar industry and the slave society, opportunities for doctors and apothecaries increased and care of the slaves became an obvious need for most planters. Most plantations of any size would have established sick houses, also known as pest houses, to confine those with infectious diseases of which there were many and illnesses that rendered them unfit for work. And a quote that I must mention here is that of Dr. Richard Towne, quoted by Dr. Carl Watson in his splendid civilized island, Barbados. Dr. Richard Towne listed hypochondriac, spelt with two Ks, among the common diseases, suggesting that many slaves feigned illness in order to avoid work. That, of course, would have had terror, could have had bad consequences because admission to the sick house or pest house might have led that person then to get one of those pestilential diseases. So doctors were hired on an annual basis to visit the plantations and the patients in the sick houses at a fixed rate per slave on each plantation. And throughout the 18th century in Barbados, there is much evidence to suggest that the rate of pay was usually six shillings per slave per year. Not a bad deal from a four pound chest of medicines. 
Many accounts confirmed this rate of pay and the arrangement for visits twice a week, but conditions were primitive. The costs of medical care were often weighed against the cost of simple replacement of the sick and dying slaves by buying new slaves. It was an economic equation, and so many West Indian islands had a net loss in slave populations rather than a net increase through reproduction. In fact, Barbados was the first of the colonies in the West Indies to convert to a net increase in slave numbers through reproduction, but it only began in the amelioration period in the 1780s. And medical care didn't do much to solve the problem. Many plants believed to have medical benefits seem to have been brought over from Africa, and at least, if not helpful, they probably did no harm and provided a great deal of psychological relief, as they still do today. One particularly potent tropical plant native in Africa and imported with the slave trade is the famous or notorious castor oil plant, Ricinus communis, which all of us over 60, I know there are very few of us over 60 here, but those few of us who are in the audience will of course remember its medicinal use in our youth. It was the laxative administered, the youngsters wouldn't know this, but it was the laxative that our mothers all gave us on the first day of school holidays. It was necessary to have a good quote unquote clean out on the first day of the holidays. And so with noses held and threats of a spanking from the mother, but hopefully rewarded with the bribe of a sweetie. Many other plants had reputations, but no specific virtues, and a few were actually poisonous. Indeed, Jamaica suffered from one of those well-renowned famous plants that was supposed to be given to infants to improve breastfeeding, the Crotillaria retusa which produced a terribly toxic disease of the liver, which was frequently fatal. Nevertheless, every society has inordinate faith in the curative powers of all plants, often based on smell, shape, the name, or whatever grandma believed. In contrast, the heroic medical interventions of the time in which the English doctors were taught, bleeding, purging, vomiting, and blistering, to restore the balance of the hypothetical humors which were postulated by the ancient Roman physician Galen 2,000 years ago. Almost certainly, these approaches did more harm than good in many cases, and ironically, not unlike today's popular alternative quackery of so-called detoxification carried out in many alternative clinics and high colonic lavage. The famous Caribbean-born physician, Dr. John Letsom, from the little island of Joss Van Dyke in the British Virgin Islands, became a Quaker and a very successful and eminent London physician in the 1760s. Now, he did a great deal of work. He led and organized medical societies, and he really was a very successful and respected doctor. But he's rem remembered rather ironically, perhaps because of his name and because of the heroic medicine practices of the time, by a lovely little verse. Next slide. This is John Letsam, and the next one shows his verse. I, John Letsam, blisters, bleeds, and sweats him, and if after that they please to die, I, John Letsam. <laughs> Certainly, the first half of the 18th century saw only a few significant advances, such as vaccination against smallpox, which would have saved many lives by the second half of the 18th century. There's no question about that value. The use of the ancient concoction of theriac, which was a traditional treacle comprising nearly a hundred ingredients, something still practiced in one form or another today, many of these poisonous, and including the dried flesh of vipers, persisted until it was removed from the British Pharmacopoeia in 1786. But it was very expensive, and I doubt that the English physicians coming here would have brought much of that with them. And bleeding and purging persisted throughout the Western world until the end of the 18th century and beyond. And in fact, famous patients like George Washington were bled to death. He, for his malignant sore throat. Next slide. And this is George 
in his, on his deathbed, as white as the driven snow, as white as the sheets he's lying on, with his physicians attending, having bled him virtually to death, and his poor wife in the background, able to say nothing. Compared to this misguided approach of 18th century medicine, there's extensive documentation of the beliefs of the slaves in their own simple cures in preference to the vicious tools of the 18th century doctors. And that is really not surprising, a matter of trust, of language, and of recognition of the pain perhaps associated with those aggressive medical approaches. So the plantations all built sick houses or pest houses to isolate those with infectious diseases which were rampant, especially yellow fever, malaria, yaws, which came from Africa, TB, measles, smallpox, and leprosy from Europe, while syphilis went the other way in what is known as the Columbian Exchange, introducing Europeans to syphilis. Barbados didn't have the Anopheles mosquito, which transmits malaria, and so it was completely spared of malaria, except for imported cases, and its later introduction for a few years in the 1920s, and then eliminated. But yellow fever was endemic across the Caribbean, and major ec epidemics occurred every few years until 1852-53. So those sick houses or pest houses were protective rather than curative, because there was nothing much one could do successfully other than supportive care. An important, an important period in Barbados was the middle of the 18th century, known as the Age of Reason in Britain, when two brilliant figures emerged, the Reverend Griffith Hughes of the parish of St. Lucy and Dr. William Hillary, Quaker physician, of whom we don't have a portrait. Now, Reverend Hughes produced an enormous book, The Natural History of Barbados, in 10 books. And the first book, or chapter, was a remarkably good description of the common diseases in Barbados. This is a picture of the Reverend Griffith Hughes' enormous folio book on the left. Now, I thought that this copy, which I have, 1750, was a really big book. It's a folio, it's 14 inches long. And then I realized that um, a couple of my friend, a couple of people I know, and the Barbados Museum actually has the larger version. And the larger version is about an inch and a half longer, an inch wider. And while the plates in my book are in black and white, the museum version has color plates, which are really rather beautiful by very, very famous lithographers. And that's important because the museum's book is the book that belonged to my great uncle, the Reverend Norton Beresford Watson, whose collection founded the museum. But here is Hugh's big book, and the little book on the right is Dr. Hillary's book of medicine, which I'll come to. And perhaps it illustrates the difference between the way priests write their prolix and circumstantial, while doctors write very briefly and to the point, hence the little book. Front page in, is shown in the next slide. Uh, of Griffith's book, Griffith Hughes' book, The Natural History of Barbados. And it was Griffith Hughes who gave an accurate and eloquent description of the sea anemones in the animal flower cave and actually gave them the name animal flowers. And he wrote a paper which he presented to the Royal Society in England on these unique animal flowers which he had discovered by climbing down the outside of the cave, not going down those convenient steps that have been created subsequently for visitors. He used the ancient method of marketing his books, and he raised 500 eminent subscribers, including lords of the realm and the Prince of Wales, to whom he dedicated the plates, Lord Fairfax of Virginia, and Samuel Johnson, the great lexicographer, the author of the famous dictionary. And his book, too, treated of the diseases common to the people, the dry belly ache in particular, once so deadly and arising in the author's opinion, from the rum. Dysentery was described, yellow fever, smallpox, and leprosy, all as the chief diseases of the times in the slaves. And he subscribed to the doctrine of signatures that God has given us a plan to cure every illness, which will usually be found in the same location where the illnesses are frequent. And they could be recognized by their physical features. For example, a juicy plant should cure thirst, 
and dehydration, and a kidney-shaped leaf would be useful to treat the kidneys, and a heart-shaped leaf for the heart, and so on. His description of the dry belly ache, however, was absolutely accurate, and his diagnosis of the cause, the rum, was correct. It was indeed caused by rum, which in those days was distilled in lead pipes, and the lead was extracted by the alcohol, it damaged the nerves, it produced lethargy and even coma in high doses and chronic constipation. Now, we, we know that those Bayesian young men who are tempted, bribed, or offered rewards to drink a pint and a half bottle of 70% rum at one go, they often go comatose as well because that's just a little bit too much, a little bit too quickly. But the rum laced with lead extracted in the distillation process produced a chronic situation of affecting nerves with lethargy coma and chronic constipation with gripes or colic without the diarrhea, hence it was called the dry bellyache as opposed to the dysentery which was totally endemic, everybody had it almost every day, dysentery or diarrhea with uh, obviously the opposite of the dry bellyache. Professor Jerome Handler, a well-known anthropologist from North Carolina and friend of Barbados who has done much work here, he was the man who discovered the slave burial site at Newton Plantation in Christchurch. An analysis of the lead content of bones which he took samples of from those graves and analyzed in North Carolina found the highest concentration of lead ever reported in human bones, indicating a, cry, a chronic high level of ingestion of lead poison rum by at least some, if not most, of the slaves. So alcohol, as is so common today, was really the opium of the slaves, keeping people perhaps happy and peaceful in the context of their dreadful lives. Now Richard Ligon, a royalist who took refuge in Barbados after the Civil War in Britain from 1647 to 1650, he wrote about rum as kill devil and fire water and, he said, as a kind of cure-all for almost all diseases. And it still is for some people. I had a Jamaican friend when we were studying in London at university and his mother used to send him a bottle of Appleton white rum every month or two and he would she would label it liniment for rubbing or rubbing alcohol, and they got away with it for a whole year. But back to the slaves at Newton. While rum was keeping the men happy after a fashion, the lead in it was slowly poisoning them, producing lassitude, no doubt labeled laziness by the slave owners, and colic or the dry belly ache, pains in the gut and constipation. Happily, today's famous Barbados rum, the rum that, as they say, down in the north, at Mount Gay, the rum that invented rum, they say. It is not distilled in lead pipes anymore, so it's relatively safe in the appropriate modest quantities. But Professor Handler's research has helped to answer some of the questions about slave society and the heavy use of alcohol by some slaves, at least those at Newton. And it's difficult to extrapolate from a single slave cemetery. After all, the manager at Newton for a particular period may have had a particularly high liking for alcohol and so his sharing of alcohol may have been very different from the slave owner at the next plantation. The most important local 18th century man of medicine or physician was Dr. William Hillary. Who was he? He was a Quaker physician from Yorkshire in England at 18 in 1715, Hillary was apprenticed to a Quaker apothecary or a pharmacist in Bradford in Yorkshire, not far from his home. And five years later, he was sent off to Leiden, the leading university in the Netherlands, with a worldwide reputation for medicine, chiefly due to the great teacher Hermann Boerhaave. And he was the absolute pioneer in teaching doctors that good medicine was learned at the bedside with the sick patient, something that the University of the West Indies Faculty of Medicine distills and explains and emphasizes more perhaps than any other university because we don't have the high-tech machinery that most American physicians will use instead of bothering to examine the patient. In 
But Hillary lived and worked here from 1747 until 1759. And in those years, he produced a brilliant book. Next slide. The Epidemical Diseases of Barbados, including a treatise on the yellow fever, etc., 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 etc. One of those typical 18th century titles that runs to nearly a hundred words. And he's a subject of another major lecture, but his description of the jaundice we now know to be leptospirosis and of tetanus, of yaws, thankfully now extinct, and his seminal first description ever of a disease called tropical sprue make him one of the great medical men of the 18th century. An annotated fourth edition of his book has been published by the UWI, next, oh. <clears throat> by the UWI Press with notes and introduction by my friend Dr. Edward Hudson and me. And Dr. Hudson, sorry, Dr. Hillary was our first epidemiologist and I consider him by far our first serious medical researcher. His observations can be said to have heralded important research both here and internationally over the last century and today. He arrived here in 1747 and attended the first meeting of Quakers in Tudor Street. Among his patients in 1751 was Lawrence, the older half-brother of George Washington, the first heroic president of the USA. And he was accompanying Lawrence in search of a cure for the TB from which Lawrence was suffering. They lived here at George Washington House, restored today by the Barbados National Trust and having a wonderful triple museum, house museum, and a magnificent film, and a very good restaurant on the side, actually, all developed by the hard work and ingenuity of Penny Heinem, who is here with us tonight. And that's where the Washington brothers lived. Lawrence moved on to Bermuda, he became more ill, and he died soon after. He obviously should have stayed here and he might have lived. But Barbados was the making of George, who was inspired by his visits to the local fortifications, joined the militia on going home, and rose rapidly in rank to become leader of the revolutionary forces in the American War of Independence. A mild bout with the smallpox in Barbados, what I tell my American colleagues is the mild Barbadian smallpox, protected him from its ravages in the War of Independence where it's been said that more of his soldiers died of smallpox than of wounds. And so we might well claim that Barbados saved George Washington, and as his biographer Jack Warner says, it made him. And I, I, as I always add when I lecture in the States, perhaps if he hadn't come to Barbados and got the mild smallpox here, he might have died on the Delaware when the epidemic took place around the Delaware River. He might never have won the War of Independence for North America, and they might um, huh, still be a colony or maybe a colony of Barbados like Charleston. In March of 1752, Hillary began his formal observations of weather patterns and patterns of disease. He wrote, the degrees of the heat or coolness of the air were observed by Fahrenheit's mercurial thermometer every morning at or before the rising of the sun, and again between the hours of 12 and 1 o'clock at noon. So likewise, the succession as well as the variations of the epidemical diseases were as carefully observed in my practice at the same time that I might observe how those diseases were caused or changed by those variations in the weather. And of course, he had a rain gauge and a hygrometer as well as his barometer and everything as humidity was considered a serious health threat in those days and he left us Barbadians with a cultural legacy that again the older ones will remember that getting wet by the rain or sitting in a cool draft would be bound to give you a fatal chill. Right? Blame Hillary for that. His impressive book, one of the very first on tropical diseases, is divided into two parts. The first is concerned with weather patterns and disease patterns, while the second is a treatise on the putrid bilious fever commonly called by some the yellow fever, and such other diseases as are indigenous in the torrid zone. The book is largely and hugely important for many reasons. The first is, it's the first comprehensive report of an epidemiological nature in English outside of Europe and in the Caribbean. It justifies my description of Hillary 
as the first Caribbean epidemiologist in the English-speaking Caribbean. And since the epidemiology is the branch of medicine that investigates the causes and control of diseases, Hillary perfectly fits that bill. Secondly, he was at the forefront in applying Borges' principles linking science, theory, and practice and making meticulous clinical observations. Although they were sometimes vague, there was often a germ of possible truth, such as linking a diet of too many herbs, roots, fruits, fruits, and crude products of the earth with diarrhea or dysentery, the term for any form of diarrhea. One of his greatest claims to fame was the convincing description of tropical sprue, which was clearly the earliest description of this condition and was extant all across what he called the torrid zone. So it survives today really only in parts of, of India. Sir Christopher Booth, his biographer and my own professor of medicine in London wrote, Hillary emphasized the cardinal clinical features of tropical sprue, the chronic nature subject to relapse and remissions, the troublesome glossitis, which is inflammation of the mouth, now known to be due to a deficiency of a vitamin called folic acid, the one that pregnant women need supplements of, the recurrent diarrheas, which gradually waste the patient, de depriving him of nourishment and leading to anemia, wasting and death. Thirdly, Hillary recognized, as no one had before, that malaria was not endemic in Barbados, as it was across the rest of the Caribbean. It was not seen here except in patients from another island, he said, who brought the disease with them. This insightful observation was reported much later by several writers, including the eminent Sir Rupert Boyce, who was Dean of the London School of Hygiene and sent to the West Indies to report on health conditions in 1905. In fact, malaria did become endemic in Barbados in the 1920s with a modest outbreak, but was then totally eradicated in the Rockefeller-funded malaria, malaria eradication program. Ironically, the said Sir Rupert Boyce, who was the mosquito expert of the era, he considered that the jaundice which Barbadians called simply Barbados jaundice was yellow fever. And there was so much jaundice causing death in the year 1910, the year that my own paternal grandmother died of jaundice, that the colonial office sent Sir Rupert, the expert on mosquito diseases, to Barbados to assess the situation, as there had been no yellow fever epidemic on the island for more than 50 years, so they were getting concerned. Sir Rupert concluded that it was yellow fever. Now, I can't help noting that in September of 2006, months after he had been knighted at the tender age of 43, he had a stroke. And you know in Barbados, knighthoods are often given to people in their late 80s, followed by their passing away. He had his at 43, had a stroke six months later, which it was said left him permanently disabled, and it must have affected his judgment, because the epidemic was not yellow fever, as was shown by another medical hero of mine, Dr. Harry Bailey that it was clearly not yellow fever. Dr. Hillary's comments nearly 200 years earlier on what he described as the putrid bilious fever, but which he said was commonly called by some the yellow fever, are very interesting. He noted that it was rarely passed from person to person, like the plague, and that the clinical features he described are in fact, today, we recognize as the features of leptospirosis. He was quite clear that it did not follow the epidemic pattern of yellow fever transmitted by mosquitoes, and Barbadian physicians simply called it Barbados jaundice until Dr. Bailey identified its cause, the leptospira organism or the spirochete, which had only been identified in 1917, 15 years before. So leptospirosis was a kind of new disease for Dr. Bailey. It was rather like the discovery of AIDS as a new disease for the doctors in the 1980s and 90s. And so Dr. Bailey was very alert to this possibility. And Bailey's research in the 1930s therefore explained and resolved Hillary's observation of 200 years earlier. Now, Dr. Bailey, best known as the founder of the Diagnostic Clinic on Beckles Road and commemorated in the Harry Bailey Observatory, he showed that the deaths from jaundice in that year of 1910 did not occur in the mosquito-infected areas, nor in family clusters, but in warehouses, 
among warehouse workers and sugarcane workers, where rats were common, and that it was almost certainly leptospirosis from the clinical and pathological features, because he not only sampled their blood, examined their urine, but he did post-mortems wherever he could. His epidemiological research and his clinical and laboratory studies in his own personal laboratory, which he set up on Bay Street in the 1930s, confirmed that the common Barbados jaundice was leptospirosis transmitted by rats. It earned him a doctorate in medicine from the University of Cambridge. And it's a dramatic example of a diagnostic dilemma of the 18th century, identified by one brilliant physician, Dr. Hillary, as a specific disease in the 1750s, mistaken by a world-famous reputable expert in 1911, but solved by the brilliant research of Dr. Bailey in the 30s. Hillary's description of tetanus, leprosy, and yaws are as good as any, and he gave an excellent description of elephantiasis, another condition transmitted by mosquitoes with hugely swollen legs, which, thought, which thankfully is no longer present in Barbados, but it was when I was a boy. It was known as Barbados leg in Guyana, and it was known as Guyana leg in Barbados. It shows how we reciprocate with each other, especially with our Guyanese cousins. And Hillary was caustic in his criticism of the silliness and the discomfort of people wearing a thick, rich coat and waistcoat in Barbados, under which he had seen men melting, preferring the character of a fop to that of a man of sense and honor. Of course, Hillary was a lifelong bachelor, so there was no wife to guide, advise, or dictate his mode of dress. But he also led the way in advising an abstemious life and a sensible diet, which Professor Hassel and his Chronic Disease Commission are doing their best to advise every day, and most people are ignoring. Now, I have a copy of the Hillary book with me. It's available at the university bookshop. I'm not sure that it's available at the museum bookshop outside and anyone who is interested might like to have a look at it and run off to the university bookshop and buy a copy. Hillary doesn't seem to have been attached to any specific plantation according to what he wrote, although he does write a lot about the care of slaves. Richard Sheridan, in his well-researched Doctors and Slaves, 1680 to 1834, the picture we had before, uh, Richard Sheridan, whose book is almost an encyclopedia of medical management and medical issues across the Caribbean during this period. He refers to the sick house in the inventory of William Belgrave's plantation in Barbados in 1755. Efforts, this, he called it Belgrove, in the text it's Belgrove, but of course we know we, we all have Belgraves in Barbados. Spelling wasn't too important in those days. Efforts to improve the medical care of slaves came after that period, the latter part of the 18th century, with the late 18th century efforts at what is known as amelioration, to ameliorate the condition of the slaves, improve their lives, and importantly, improve their longevity. Now, Dr. James Granger, who worked in St. Kitts, he described in his book of 1764 his model for a complete sick house. Next slide. And on page 53 of my friend Edward Hudson's other book compilation on the treatment and management of the more common West Indies diseases, and the next one, he says, every plantation ought to have a large sick house, and if it were floored, not a dirt floor, in other words, a timber floor, so much the better. He says it should be built near but to the leeward, that is, downwind, so that those pestilential fevers would not affect the manager's house, downwind of the dwelling house, meaning the main plantation house, but so that it can be closely supervised by the planter. He goes on, the nurses, however, are commonly so old that they cannot take proper care of the sick. A nurse should be strong, sensible, and sober. And of the building itself, he said, the windward ward for surgical and common medical cases should have a piazza, a term for an open space, a veranda, and each of them a necessary. You know what a necessary is? A latrine. A necessary or a latrine. Today, only one surviving plantation building in Barbados has been identified as a slave hospital. 
This is the beautiful Palladian building at the Grant the Adams Secondary School in St. Joseph. It's a watercolor sketch of mine. It's a, no, a long, narrow building, almost 100 feet long, extremely well ventilated with very large windows, more than five feet wide, divided into two long wards. One ward for the men, as shown here in the next picture, with the deputy principal of Grant the Adams School, Mr. Holder and one for the women, with a central two-story portion for nurses and storage. And the, the building is long and narrow, with this symmetry of two wards on either side, a central service area in the middle, elegantly pedimented, and clearly appropriate for nothing else. And it followed the directions of Dr. Granger, of being 100 yards to the leeward of the plantation house, and very, very well ventilated. The construction of rubble and rough-hewn, irregular coral stone shown in this picture suggests a late 18th century date. In other words, the stones had become a little bit more regular than standard early 18th century and 17th century rubble, but not yet comprising the, the sawn soft stone blocks that came into fashion in the 1830s and each ward could have held about a dozen beds, six on either side with a four-foot space in between, exactly as recommended by Mr. Gibbs, the Barbadian proprietor, quoted by Sheridan. It is near but downwind of the plantation house of Blackman's Great House, now demolished and today the site of the Grant the Adams Secondary School. Sadly, when the building was used as a carpenter's workshop over the years, a fire occurred some seven or eight years ago, destroying the roof, and efforts to have it restored have not been successful. And I make a plea here because on behalf of the school, it would make a perfect art studio and gallery with those long walls, and by incorporating it in this slave route tour, which the Barbados Museum organizes, it would promote student art, an obvious win-win project for history, for heritage, for the slave route tour, and for the students and their creativity. And so I am sure that the d deputy director of the museum will take my suggestion on now. Although Hillary wasn't associated with any university or medical school like Edinburgh, his book must have had a major impact on his contemporaries and students of medicine of the day because the second edition came just seven years later in 1766. And in 1811, it was republished across the pond in Philadelphia, then the intellectual capital of America, of North America, with annotations and fulsome praise for it by Dr. Benjamin Rush, the most famous American physician of that era who treated General Washington, President Washington as well. And it's worth noting that Dr. Rush's annotations indicated little, if any, advance in medical knowledge over that of Dr. Hillary over those 50-something years. Now, Hillary's warnings on prescribing were blunt and should be taken note of. They were widely noted, if not followed, he ended his preface with the words, as for those who will neither read nor yet know how to reason on the causes or manner of the production of diseases, and yet will boldly practice by rote and prescribe by guess at a venture, though the life of the patient depends on the right or wrong method of prescribing, I must seriously advise them at least to peruse the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. And James Granger, in his book, five years later, he echoes Hillary in almost the exact same words. This is not plagiarism because the words are different, but the theme and the thought are exactly the same. Planters should remember the sixth commandment. Those who presume to prescribe to the sick and are not qualified by study and experience to do so must be considered murderers. Now we all know that health has a great deal to do with social conditions and nutrition. Social conditions with exceptions such as Joshua Steele's experiment at Kendall in the 1780s were generally appalling. Arms houses and poor relief were established very early in the parish of St. Michael where the vestry minutes record details of the costs and the staffing of the almshouse as early as 1664, as well as those indigent poor given modest sums for support. And when you read those minutes with the absolutely unbelievably elegant handwriting, but very precise, 
with every indigent person's name in full and the exact amount, one pound five shillings, which was going to last them for three or four months. I've not found reference to the almshouse in the vestry minutes of St. John until much later. 1818 was the first reference I found there. But their lists of paupers being given financial help uh, between one and four pounds every few months was consistently much longer than that of St. Michael. And I suspect that these were perhaps the more starving of the poor whites of below the cliff. An interesting feature of the past was the provision for indigent relatives among the planters and priests. The indigent poor relation was often accommodated in the great house or the rectory in a special little room built over the kitchen of the plantation house or rectory. It was called the poor relations room for the feeble-minded, the schizophrenic, the alcoholic, the demented or otherwise impaired relative who needed support and on whom the occupant of the great house or rectory had an obligation to look after but to keep out of sight of his friends, neighbors, and social equals. And such poor relations rooms exist mostly in the country in St. John, St. George, and St. Philip. Uh, there is a well-known one in St. John's Rectory and several plantation houses. And I do appeal to anyone who is aware of such a little room stuck on as an addition over the kitchen wing of a large house. Do please tell me about it. The high mortality rate of the slaves and the contrast between their poor diet and the excesses of the wealthy planters like Colonel Walron, described by Richard Ligon in his book of 1657, where they had dozens of dishes, every conceivable dish on the table for a big lunch, which would last throughout the day. They're well documented. Jerome Handler and others have published extensively on a wide range of documents detailing slave diets, largely simple fare like rice and salted fish on the Middle Passage across the Atlantic, of course, and on the plantation itself, ground provisions, which perhaps expresses why young Barbadians think that it's beneath them to eat ground provisions. But plantains and bananas along with the yams and potatoes with a standard portion of salted fish and occasionally beef or pork. And we're all familiar, of course, with the tradition of the trotters and the ear, ears and the tail of the pork of the pig celebrated in today's South till today. But the debate is about the portion sizes and the inadequacy for optimum health for a hard working man or woman. In the 1824 report of the Committee of the Council of Barbados to inquire into the actual condition of the slaves, 1824, in the period 30 years, 40 years into amelioration and just a decade before emancipation. It was claimed in that report by the planters that they issued a pound of fish daily. While Handler's findings in the Newton plantation slave record, uh, plantation records said that half a pound of salt fish was issued every two weeks. That kind of discrepancy, discrepancy is perhaps redolent of what we hear in our chambers on debate on the radio this week. So the general truth could be anywhere in between. Now, after emancipation, the planters felt that their responsibility for the health of the former slaves was over. After all, they were free men and women. And so there was a huge hiatus in health care and responsibility for it. And it was eventually filled by setting up an appeal three years after 1838, two years after 1838, to build the General Hospital, the wonderful old General Hospital opened in 1841 after just over a year to be built through public subscription supplemented by a small grant from the government. So I say to the government, if you want philanthropy, you've got to give that small grant ideally a matching grant. This was a significant advance, but public health measures were still slow to come. The massive yellow fever epidemic of 1852, 1853, beginning with the ship the Dauntless commemorated in the churchyard of St. Matthias in Hastings, introducing yellow fever, followed by the cholera epidemic in 1854, which took more than 20,000 lives and led to cholera grounds all over Barbados where people were buried in mass graves. It brought home forcibly the horrendous conditions of the working class and particularly the lack of clean water, living on dirty ponds and some rainwater from roofs and generally a shortage of water. Diseases were rampant, 
And an excellent summary is provided by Professor Jerome Handler, again, in his paper in the Journal of Caribbean History, readily available at the University Library, Volume 40, Diseases and Medical Disabilities of Enslaved Barbadians. As Professor Handler wrote, the susceptibility to infectious diseases was greatly increased by their general debilitation and omnipresent malnutrition. The Reverend James Young Edgell's book, and James Young Edgell was the first Barbadian Moravian priest of great worth and honesty, hard work. He gives, his book gives a vivid description of the squalor in which many people lived. Many of those after emancipation who couldn't, as in Jamaica or Trinidad, flee into the mountains but didn't want to work on the plantations, lived in caves. What did come out of the cholera epidemic was the development of a supply of piped water from Newcastle and later Codrington Springs in the Republic of St. John into Bridgetown in 1861. And this was literally a watershed for the health of the people of Bridgetown. The Bowmanston pumping station in St. John followed in 1890 with wells into the large deep underground lake there and then many other wells into our water table across the island. But domestic connections were only 10,000 by the middle of the last century, 1950, with most villagers still relying on standpipes, which became the women's social equivalent for gathering and gossip of the rum shop for the men. But it was only after decades of relentless advocacy by Dr. Sir John Hudson, who has been called the father of public health in Barbados, that a number of public health acts were eventually passed, and yet with little improvement until the Moyne Commission after the riots of 1937. The Colonial Development and Welfare Department instituted scholarships for training doctors and other health personnel. Each parish provided from the vestry expenses and the land taxes a parish medical officer, a poor law inspector, a health inspector to eliminate those mosquitoes, and so on. And eventually, a central board of health was established. The first public health clinic opened in Spikestown in 1953 under Dr. later Sir Maurice Byer, followed by one at Enmore, and then one at Six Roads in St. Philip. That first public health clinic was in the house that then became the Lions Club House for the North, and is now the Arlington House Interactive Museum uh, developed and restored by the Barbados National Trust. Now, undoubtedly, there was a great deal of malnutrition throughout this period. And infant malnutrition was a kind of star of the malnutrition victims. It remained a scandalous problem in Barbados until the 1950s, second in the data for the 50s only to St. Vincent. The revolution in the understanding and elimination of infant malnutrition was led by the research, education, and energy of Dr. Sir Frank Ramsey. And, sorry, that was the Poor Relations Home at St. John's Rectory. Next one. Sir Frank Ramsey, who headed the National Health Service and the efforts to establish the Barbados National Drug Service, was a pediatrician and a nutritionist. And he basically eliminated malnutrition in infants in the 1960s with his groundbreaking development of the highly significant National Nutrition Center and his evangelical passion for educating the nation, mothers through his nursing team, and summarized in his book, Protein Energy Malnutrition in Barbados. And here I pause to say that Sir Frank Ramsey, Sir Morris Byer, previously mentioned, Dr. Sir John Hudson and Professor Sir Kenneth Standard named a public health hero in the celebration of PAHO a few years ago. These really are the giants who have done more for public health in Barbados than anyone else. Finally, the hardships and rigors of the Middle Passage and the deprivations of the plantation society may have contributed significantly to our massive chronic disease epidemic of today pun intended with the word massive, being addressed by the research efforts of the Chronic Disease Research Center or CDRC and the educational efforts of the National Chronic Disease Commission.
It's now been well established and widely accepted by medical scientists that the chronic non-communicable non nutrition-related diseases of adulthood are related to growth patterns in early life, that is, in the fetus and infancy due to poor nutrition. This is known as the Barker hypothesis or the thrifty gene or thrifty phenotype hypothesis first proposed by Barker in 1992 and firmly demonstrated by data from the Tropical Metabolism Research Unit in Jamaica. Individuals with a thrifty phenotype, thrifty, you, you save, you conserve, will have a smaller body size and a lower metabolic rate. Adaptations to an environment short of food and nutrition. The problem is that people then with that thrifty phenotype living in an affluent environment like today in our post-independent society with lots of fast food and much less physical activity are then much more prone to obesity, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes and the complications thereof, stroke, heart attack and kidney failure. A further theory proposed by my friend and colleague Dr. Clarence Grimm of the University of Wisconsin is that the vomiting and diarrhea of the Middle Passage and the endemic dysentery in early Barbados produced major salt deprivation. And those who could survive salt deprivation were those who could retain salt. And as your nurses will have told you, and nurses in the audience well know, salt is related to high blood pressure, and this could have perpetuated the gene and a phenotype for salt retention and a propensity in our population for high blood pressure. Now, when I came home in 1977 and I saw the size of the obesity epidemic, pun intended, and followed the burden of increasing chronic diseases, burden, pun intended, it led to the establishment of our chronic disease research center. Now, the very idea of a research center here was poo-pooed by many, but with the brilliant work of Professor Anselm Hennis, my successor, and my friend now, Professor Clive Landis, in the audience and their research teams, the CDRC is a shining star of the university addressing these diseases, diagnoses, and development. The theme, Mr. Chairman, of this lecture series, the diseases, the diagnoses, and the development, the umbrella theme of our series. And the next slide shows the chronic disease. <clears throat> Sorry, no, this slide shows the general hospital. I missed that one out. And it shows the general hospital, and I, go back please, I showed that particular view of the general hospital because it showed the, the steel shed erected on the left of this splendid Palladian Nightingale type hospital building. That steel shed is to make sure that the paint on the ambulances does not get spoilt by the sun. And so we have the situation of an 1841 building perverted and aborted with a steel shed next to it. But the next slide shows the Chronic Disease Research Center on the corner of the Ina Walters Roundabout and Jemmets Lane. And the approach of research, and one more slide which shows the main entrance of this 18, early 19th century building, more than 200 years old. The approach of research begun nearly 300 years ago is finally being put into practice at the CDRC. And the diagnostic riddle of Barbados jaundice was solved by Dr. Bailey, the endemic malnutrition by Sir Frank Ramsey, and the plantation legacy of obesity-related chronic diseases. These are a much bigger, much more complex, and much more entrenched problem which the CDRC is tackling. Their work is wide-ranging, and it now provides details from the Health of the Nation study in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and the Statistical Department, and much of it is very disturbing, and it shows that it requires major national effort to address our national health. The survey provides information on the prevalence and the social determinants of risk factors for the lifestyle-related chronic diseases, or NCDs, to identify targets for intervention. Data were collected for 1,234 participants, a 55% response rate from those invited, <clears throat> over 25 years of age, on their demographics, behavioral risk factors, their medical history, their place of treatment and the costs incurred, their blood pressure, their anthropometry, that is their body shape and size, and biochemical measures 
The survey shows that Bayesian adults are at high risk from the NCDs due to high prevalence of both biological and behavioral risk factors. Most alarming is that two in every three adults and three quarters of our women are overweight and or obese. The last, not the last, but on one occasion when I pointed that out publicly and said we needed to do something about it, I was roundly abused in the press as being anti women. I protest. But these are the facts. Two in every three adults and three quarters of women. Only a half of men are overweight and or obese. More than one in three adults have high blood pressure. And for those over 65, it's more than half. And one in five have diabetes. And for those over 65, it is half. At least one in three of those with known hypertension or diabetes and known to be on treatment were not properly controlled. Fruit and vegetable consumption is low and half of the sample reported low levels of physical activity. These results are quite frankly diabolical. An important symbol of where we have come from is the mural high up on the wall of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Have you noticed that mural? It was designed over 50 years ago. It shows a slim, barefooted young mother, probably anemic from hookworm through her bare feet. She carries an infant in her arms while the toddler at her side, displaced from the breast by the new infant, is obviously malnourished. It created a storm of protest that it was an offense to the health system of Barbados when it was designed in 1963. Today, that young lady, so slim then, almost certainly has high blood pressure and diabetes and possibly an amputation, while her 50 and 52-year-old daughters have high blood pressure and diabetes. So, ladies and gentlemen, urgent action is needed to address our low levels of healthy behavior and our high levels of biological risk. A multi-sectoral approach is needed with national guidelines to support an appropriate regulatory framework in an enabling environment. And there are ways of doing that which other countries have led with. And I hope I've illustrated how understanding the past and the problems of the past can help us in attaining our optimal development through research and the translation of research into policy programs and practice. And I hope that the rest of these lectures as planned, will lead to a serious dialogue on how we can best provide health care and promote healthy living, which we so desperately need to have a discussion about. Next slide. Thank you.